miracles do happen. A gorgeously imaginative new musical is now on Broadway. Water for Elephants is a New York Times critic's pick. It's stunning, emotional, spellbinding entertainment. A dazzling love story, propulsive with passion. Don't miss the best new musical on Broadway. Water for Elephants. Get tickets now at telecharge.com and choose the ride. Hey, I'm Ryan Reynolds. Recently, I asked Mint Mobile's legal team if big wireless companies are allowed to raise prices due to inflation. They said yes. And then when I asked if raising prices technically violates those onerous two-year contracts, they said, what the f*** are you talking about, you insane Hollywood ass. So to recap, we're cutting the price of Mint Unlimited from $30 a month to just $15 a month. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows full terms at mintmobile.com. Hi guys, and welcome to this week's episode of Heavy Metal Tones, me, your podcast host, Tony Evans, delving into the world of all things music, um, or heavy music anyway. Uh, this week's episode, as you can tell by the title, and as I also mentioned a few weeks like on one of my TikToks, if you follow me on that particular platform, please do come and watch my stupid videos, um, is about Gary Moore. Now, Gary Moore, it, uh, and I've mentioned this before, way back in early episodes of the show, uh, but he is one of he, no. He is my guitar hero. You know, people have a guitar hero. You know, people will say it's could be Clapton, Jeff Beck, Pete Green, Peter Green, whoever. You know, Sebastian Park, whoever you want to be, whoever your favorite is. Mine is Gary Moore. Uh, it, for a long time, for a very long time, was actually Eric Clapton as a young boy because that's what was played in my house. Um, uh, my brother played Clapton a lot and so when I sort of fell in love with the guitar from a very early age that was the sort of my initiation into what guitar could be and I don't mean his sort of more sedate stuff I'm talking about the stuff with cream you know and um, stuff like cocaine and all that sort of stuff with a wild and Layla that everyone you know loves Layla don't they and that Layla riff um, but when I sort of turned around, I don't know what age was I now. Um, I think I was about, so uh, Still Got the Blues came out in 1990. And I'd heard him um, before then, at about 88, I think, um, on top of the pops. And thought this guy was like amazing. It was silly. It was a really silly video. I remember him saying a long trench coat with his red fender and... Um, in, in a theatre somewhere, I think it, I think it was Empty Rooms, it was a single, I, we'll get to that, so I thought long and hard about doing this show because um, I have done um, shows on my heroes before, as you know, with Tony Martin and things like that, and Tony Doolan from Venom Inc and Venom, and, it's, it, and Black Sabbath and all those, and Iron Maiden and Marillion and all that sort of stuff, but this one seems a little bit more personal to me because I never... Never got to see him live. Uh, I remember the day that he passed away, very, very vividly. Um, well, not the day he died, but when I found out he died. And um, yeah, I, I, and it he, he just means something a lot to me. So I was, I was a little bit concerned that I could give the right information and do the right thing for Gary. And um, because this is why it's gonna be a two-part series. Uh, this week's episode is just, you know, well, like the history, a brief history of the man. If I get anything wrong for those Gary Moore fashionados out there, please do let me know. This is purely drawn from as much information as I could get um, about the man and all and stuff I already knew. And um, and then second part will be a dive into his catalogue. I'm going to choose um, top five five top albums and five tracks. The five albums will be a um, mix across his solo career and his stuff with his with other bands, and then the tracks will be the same thing. Uh, so it's not going to be purely just 
um, Gary Moore solo stuff is going to mix across. So, Gary Moore, where do we start? Okay, um, now, hang on, I've got to find one. I, I, had this, I started using notes in my book, and I had a blank page, and uh, I was sitting there in the cafe writing notes, and I realized that I'd used the middle of the book. One second, I'm just going to find my notes. This is good research, baby. Here you go. So Gary Moore, born on the 4th of April, 1952 in Belfast. And he died on the 6th of February, 2011 in Espona, Spain, at the age of 58 of a heart attack. Now, I heard that. I was, on, I was about to go to work, about to go and get the bus to work. It was a cold, cold coldish morning for February here. And um, I opened up, you know, Daily Mail on my phone, as you do. And there was a picture of Gary Moore and it said, Irish guitar legend dead at 58 and to say that I wept is an understatement I had to sit on the bus on my own there was no, no one else on the bus that time and I just pumped on still got the blues through my head, headphones and I, and I sent a message to my friend Steve in Sydney he was just an amazing guitarist and a big Gary Moore fan as well and um, he sent me back he, he, rec he recorded Parisian walkways, note for note, that morning for me I, on a DAT file. I've got it somewhere. I'm going to have to find it. Um, it's on an old, old laptop, so it'll be somewhere. But he sent it to me, and it just made me cry even more, strangely enough. Anyway, um, he was born Robert William Gary Moore, and he was active musically between the age of six, 1968 to 2011. And the bands that you were with, and we'll talk about those a bit in the future, uh, more forward uh, for sure in the episode. Skid Row, not the Skid Row hair metal band. Um, don't get all excited. A different Irish rock band, blues Irish rock band called Skid Row. Obviously, Thin Lizzy, if you didn't know, he was in Thin Lizzy. And I didn't realise the extent of ins and outs he did with Thin Lizzy, which we'll find out later on. Coliseum 2, which was the is, was a, a jazz fusion band. G-Force, which is a band he formed in the States. And then with Greg Lake couple of albums and an album right at the end of his career uh, called, uh, with a band called Scars um, but also lots and lots of his own solo work of course influenced by Peter Green and Eric Clapton he began um, his musical journey um, in the 1960s with Skid Row who released two albums um, he his father first put him on the stage um, it was the age of 10 or 6 I think sorry I read that scene and just told him to um, sing along with this because uh, along with this local band because his father was a uh, pr promoter um, for uh, a, a local um, musical venue uh, in his local town where he where he grew up. Uh, born to a housewife Winnie, um, and that you know back then it what they were housewives. So don't sort of go shaking your your fist at me. That's the truth. And Robert, who was a promoter for the Queen's Ballroom in Hollywood, H-O-L-Y, Wood. Now, that's not in America. That's a little place in, in near um, in Northern Ireland, near Belfast. He grew up there in a nice part of the country, right? He had four siblings. I know that feeling. Um, and um, he loved being with his dad um, in the venue. He loved to go to work with his dad. In the age of six, as I said, he was chucked on stage and started to sing with his local band. Um, he, his father first bought his first guitar, an acoustic guitar, a German um, company uh, called uh, Frums, F-A-R-A-M-U-S. Now, they were um, making guitars between 1945 and, and they folded in 1975. He was given that guitar at the age of 10. Being left-handed, which again, I didn't know this, um, he learned to play right-handed. Uh, a, little, a little side note there, um, is that I, when I was learning to play the guitar, uh, I play like Gary Moore. So I, Gary Moore stretches quite a long way um, to get his triplets and his notes in. He doesn't sort of move his arm down. He stretches his um, third finger down and barely uses his second finger, which is the same as me because I broke my second finger, my index finger. Um, is it second finger's main index finger? Second finger, anyway. When I was five, and it's bent, so um, I can pick my nose around corners. No, no, I'm um, uh, it, it, It's bent, so I don't, I can't really 
um, and it doesn't move that well so I can't really hold certain notes um, and so I copied him I was I and I didn't do it deliberately I just watched him so much on video I had, I had a VHS video of him when I was like a teenager and I wore it thin and I'd watch him play and and, and he got that technique now it must be because I'm thinking if he was left-handed and he started fretting with his right hand he would have been faster would he not I, anyway I, 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 I'm, I, I'm going off the sidetrack there okay um, he formed his first band called the Beat Boys not long after um, they were they were fashioned after the Beatles and they did Beatles covers then he went on to a band called Platform 3 um, and he was um, sort of introduced to Rory Gallagher um, with him at those venues with the band Platform Free. And Rory Gallagher, another Irish guitar legend, another one of my heroes. Um, so again, another sadly not with us. Uh, if you have a chance to watch, if you want to watch real true guitar legends, I mean, true masters of their craft, you know, you're going to look at and go back to my early episodes. I'm sure I've mentioned it. You know, Gary Moore, Rory Gallagher, um, Peter Green. You know, and these are these are not the heavy metal ones. These are the blues ones, guys. You know, Clapton at his best. I know he, you know, he's a bit of a dick, but Clapton at his best. You know, these people, Jeff Beck, um, they just knew how to master the, the neck of the guitar. And um, he had amazing finger speed amazing finger speed many people said uh, about Gary Moore that he um, sort of in helped invent or was part of the shredding movement of the 80s now if you don't know what shredding is it just means very very fast finger picking like technique um, he denies that because he always always said that they had no soul and no technique it was just all about technique and no and I agree yes Gary Moore can go off at blistering speeds I mean sometimes um, he sort of takes your breath away where when it should be a bit slower he just loves he gets very very passionate with his music and his, and his movement um and yes i could see why they would say that but the same people will say that eddie van halen invented tapping um he mastered it but he didn't invent it um and i think that's the same with with uh, shredding and gary moore gary moore just played very fast texas blues if you want to listen you go and put on some old texas blues they play fast okay um, and that's basically, you know, that's Gary Moore to a T, right? Um, after playing with those local bands, um, he left Belfast for Dublin in 1968, just as the trouble started. So the troubles, um, sadly to say that those Irish people listening to the show would know, and many people in London would know, and a lot of people would know, was the, um, segre you know, the Protestants and the Catholics and the, and the British rule you know the army ira and all that sort of stuff I'm, I'm, i don't know enough to be to make an absolute informed conversation about it so i don't want to offend anyone but that's i remember it vividly but i only remember it, the um explosions in london and being forced off trains and stuff i don't know i didn't really know the political side of it and uh, i'm sure that um that it's not very pretty but that's why he left um and years later, uh, his parent. A year later, his uh, parents separated. Okay, which sort of um, whether that's bad, right? whether that's part of the story, but it's part of his life story, isn't it? Um, in the mid seventies, he was involved in a bar fight that left uh, him with facial scars. If you see pictures of Gary Moore, I once got told by a good friend of mine, Dave, and he knows if he's listening to this. <laughs> did once call him the ugliest man in rock and roll. Um, he probably is, to be fair. No, he isn't. He's a gorgeous man. Um, and you are David too, aren't you? You're gorgeous. Uh, <laughs> but he's got a point. No, um, he does look like he's been in a bar fight. Now, what happened is that he had... Um, two men in a bar were saying lewd and lascivious things about what they wanted to do to his girlfriend at the time. Gary never shy away, being a tough Irish boy, never shied away from a fight. Got involved and one of the men glassed him. Smashed the bottle and stuck it in his face. Uh, it, very horrible. I've seen that happen in real life, and it's quite a, a horrible thing to see, to be fair. Um, and that left him with lots of mental scars for many years. Uh, and, and right up until his, to his death, they, they said that he had... It changed him. It changed him. He became uh, a different man after the um, 
after the fight. It was actually at Dingwalls in Camden Town, which is like a, a blues jazz bar. We wouldn't think that there'd be a tough nuts acting like idiots in Dingwalls, would you? You'd think we were like, you know, people in berets with moustaches smoking long cigarettes and um, stripy jumpers and saying words like, now, groovy and nice. Um, but no, it wasn't. Um, yeah, according to Eric Bell, who was one of the founding members, guitarist of Thin Lizzy, who we knew really well, Eric said that he was never quite the same again. Um, he would then use his, um, vent his anger through his music. Uh, probably why in the 80s he got very, very, um, uh, he got very funny about his looks. Like he would either be photographed from different angles, he would use lots of makeup. He would, he wouldn't, you try and hide it. Um, but then on, but as he got older, that was like, well, who cares now? Look, is it, I am what I am. But it did change him musically. He became more pent up, and you can tell that because his early albums, uh, which we'll talk about in another episode, are quite. They look, they're um, a, a, an eclectic mix of, you know, blues and jazz fusion, and even some prog. Dare I say there? Uh, but yes, you know. So, sort of different things, and then he became very heavy in the um, in the sort of eighty mid uh, late seventies, sort of early eighties, and it did change him. Um, whether that's for the good, I don't know. But it, it, you've got to think to yourself: it would change anyone, wouldn't it? I mean, being slashed out like that, out, having a nice that night out with your girlfriend at a nice jazz bar, and suddenly you're going home in, in an ambulance with um, with thirty five to fifty stitches across your face. Not very nice, is it? Um, he, married his, he married his first wife, Kerry, in 1985, and they separated in 1993. They had two sons, Jack, who's like his dad, plays just like his dad. If you get a chance to see Jack play, he's unbelievable. And Gus. And later he had a daughter, Lily, with a different, with a, who was also a musician, um, with his then girlfriend, Joe Rendig. Um, and they had a second daughter. And now I found this name uh, hard to pronounce and I'm really going to apologize to the lovely lady and to anyone who has this name it's spelled s-a-o-i-r-s-e is it cerise I'm not sure um with another relationship anyway um and now he's deaf we'll get on to the bands he was in a second but we're just talking about his personal life so he's deaf um happened in the early hours of the 6th of February 2011 he died of a heart attack while in his sleep. Now, Eric Bell said, and his partner also said, that um, the Hotel Kaminsky is in Espona in Spain, in Spain uh, he had a blood alcohol level of 0.38. Now, apparently, fatal is 0.40. And to be considered drunk, you're 0.008. So you can imagine the amount of alcohol that was in his system. He did later in life have a drink problem, um, a, like a lot of very creative um, people. He had issues, you know, like great comedians are very sad and things like that. You know, he had issues um, in and out of bands over the years that were, that were abusing alcohol and drugs. Uh, so he had a history of both of those things, but. Um, and he's an and being Irishman, that they, they and this is I'm really chucking uh, a um, a thing at the wall here, but you know he, he liked his drink, okay? He liked Scotsmen, they like their drink. Scots people, are Scottish, the the Scottish, I mean, and the Irish, you know. And I think sometimes people like Gary had an image to to withhold, and having some failed marriages, who knows. Who knows what's going on in people's heads? It's a sad and morrison thing, but he used alcohol, and sadly, this particular time on his holiday with his then girlfriend, uh, he died. He had a very um, quiet funeral, just close friends and um, and family, and he's buried in a in a, a private cemetery in Saint Margaret's Churchyard in Rottingdean on the south coast, kind of south coast of England, uh, and. At his funeral, his son and his uncle Cliff, his uncle Jack, his son Jack and his uncle Cliff, uh, saying "Danny boy," and there wasn't a dry eye apparently in the cemetery. I can actually really truly believe that. And that's Gary Moore, really, in an instant. So you know, born after the war, um, you know, 
the forgotten generation as often um, they are mentioned because they're not known for heroics of the war. They're not old enough to be part of the lovey hippie movement. You know, um, like my father's generation, really similar thing. You know, they 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 were sort of the forgotten generation, and we and we generally do forget that that you know people. Talk, oh, my grandfather fought in the war, and I say it all the time. My grand, both my grandparents. Um, well, no, my mother, my father's father, my grandfather's father didn't. My grandmother, I'm sorry, my mother's father didn't fight in the war. He was too old. Um, but you know, they, they, you, you'd say that, wouldn't you? Oh, what, my grandfather did this, my father did that, and so on. We're sort of between the wars, and uh, Billy Bragg absolutely beautifully sums it up in his song "Between the Wars." Um, but that's him. That's the man. That's my hero. All right, my hero in a in a nutshell. I have talked for almost twenty minutes, would you believe, and I haven't had a break yet. Let me quickly have a break, and we'll come back and just talk roughly about the bands he was in, some of his influences, and then other things, and then we'll set up for next week's episode about uh, my fa the top five of each, as I mentioned before. Um, talk to you about on the other side, guys. Hope you enjoyed that. It's um, really sort of brought me in a sort of a maudlin feel now because Gary's gone. Anyway, um, talk to you soon. Bye. Miracles do happen. A gorgeously imaginative new musical is now on Broadway. Water for Elephants is a New York Times critic's pick. It's stunning, emotional, spellbinding entertainment. A dazzling love story, propulsive with passion. Don't miss the best new musical on Broadway. Water for Elephants. Get tickets now at telecharge.com and choose the ride. Hey, I'm Ryan Reynolds. Recently, I asked Mint Mobile's legal team if big wireless companies are allowed to raise prices due to inflation. They said yes. And then when I asked if raising prices technically violates those onerous two-year contracts, they said, what the f*** are you talking about, you insane Hollywood ass!" So to recap, we're cutting the price of Mint Unlimited from $30 a month to just $15 a month. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows full terms at mintmobile.com. Bye for now. Welcome back, guys. I've dried my eyes. I've refreshed my drink. I'm not so maudlin now. Um, although I will be playing some loud Gary Moore after I uh, stop recording today. So, as we mentioned at the beginning, influences. So, Gary Moore's biggest influences were, obviously, Peter Green uh, of Fleetwood Mac. If you don't know who Peter Green is, um, please, 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 please. If you do anything for me, and you, honestly, even if you're the most ardent black metal fan that seems to be still listening to my program go and listen to peter green any of his solo stuff any of his early fleetwood mac not all fleetwood mac is rumors okay yes if you know that and if those that know what fleetwood mac means there's an album called rumors a big album it's not it's not all um you know that it, it is originally you know beautiful guitar work and um there's just some pieces of music that just make you smile, and Peter Green is one of those ones. He obviously liked all the blues stuff, so he's big BB King, Albert King, um, Jeff Beck, you know, he, he, uh, uh, Hendrix. You know, he he's influenced by all means of guitarists, and his sound was um, his sound developed over the years okay and from the beginning to before he died when he became you know known for his blues again and a lot of that sound is down to one particular reason now let me find my right down <laughs> where am i so one second oh yes okay his 1959 les paul 
guitar. Now, as you all well know, I love Les Paul guitars. I think Les Paul is the sound of rock and roll. It's the dirty, gritty, blues-driven, overdriven beast of a guitar. Um, Fenders for me are make brilliant bass. I make the only only bass I'd ever own is really is a, that I like to play as a Fender. But um, guitars, as in six strings, you know, for me they're a bit uh, they're a bit. God, Johnny's going to hate me for saying this. They're a little bit Pink Floydy for me. Okay, a little bit twangy. The too thinner sound for me. But I mean, I, I owned a Fender when, many years ago, a Strat. Um, that my mum bought me my very first guitar my mother bought me was a was a fender strat copy and every time i used the the um tremolo it put out a tune by two steps it's hilarious um and mum never paid for any and it was out of a catalog and the catalog country company went bust go figure good on mum anyway um it was given he bought it off of peter green for a hundred pounds now that was probably the greatest hundred pounds ever spent in rock and roll uh, I personally think um, Peter Green at the time was getting rid of all of his belongings. He was, it was just, I think maybe just after he had this weird acid trip in Holland. I'm not quite sure. Um, but again, Peter Green, that's a different story. He did, he went, um, he took some bad acid and, and it fucked him over and it, it took away from the world one of the greatest guitarists. Um, but anyway, he was never the same again. So he sold the guitar to, to Gary Moore. Um, now I saw interviews with Gary. And he like, oh yeah, I've drilled a hole in this. I don't really care. It's just an, it's just an instrument to me. It's a tool. Now, the reason it's the greatest his guitar ever made and the greatest purchase in history was that what happened at the factory is that they uh, had wired the humbuckers, the P90s, I think they were, aren't they on a, on, on the 58, um, and it wired them um, out of phase. And so they got this particular different sound, and Gary took it um, took it to a, a guitar specialist in on um, in Denmark Street uh, in London, the where all the guitars are, uh, and he rewired it back into phase, and, and he tried to play it. No, 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 put it back, and so they, they put it back, and uh, and the sound itself is very very unique it's actually one of the most um, valuable guitars in history i believe i think maybe something like if a paul mccartney one ever went up that was like like a particularly special one or if they found hendrix one he set a light but that's the one that's the holy grail of guitars isn't it um probably worth more but in 2006 it was sold for seventy five thousand pounds gary morse said that he had reasons to do so who's us to ask i mean as i said you know he had drinking problems um you know, who know his financial situation was, who knows, you know. He'd been married a few times, a few kids, alimony, all that kind of thing. Um, and then uh, it was sold for 1.2 million following that one. And after he died, uh, Kirk Hammett of, um, of Metallica fame bought it for just under two million pounds. Now, there's a, a wonderful thing written into the contract of buying this guitar by Gary. It can never leave England. It can only be um, it can only be his guitar tech that that looks after it. It can't leave. It can only be uh, it can only be escorted around by his guitar tech. So wherever it goes, I, I went and saw a um, a Peter Green a film at the film, cinema with John, my good friend John, uh, about Peter Green, and it was like a tribute to Peter Green with all the different guitarists. So Kirk Hammett came on, and I hate to say this, but absolutely butchered that guitar. He, he is not, he does not have the finesse and the, he's a brilliant guitarist. I'm not going to deny that, but he does not have the finesse. Well, I was, the one thing I wanted to see most of all in that whole bloody movie, I wanted to see, I wanted to see the Greenies guitar being played and it, it just didn't, he just did not sell it. He could not make that thing sound like Gary. He could not make that thing sound like Peter Green. I know they're two different people when you're shouting at me going, but they're two different people tones. I know they are, but he just couldn't. He just, ooh, and I cracked a tooth that night on a popcorn kernel as well. Remember that? You know, but the movie, the show was amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, uh, you have Mick Fleetwood on drums, which is unbelievable. Uh, and of course, also there's, um, you know, um, the wonderful um, 
Ah, oh, you know, I'm going. I am absolutely gone blank. One moment, I have to pause to get my brain into action because I didn't write this down. This is a side tangent. David Gilmore. David Gilmore was pers persuaded to come in and play something. I think it's Seagulls, and he was really, really nervous. He, David Gilmore, nervous to play a Peter Green music on stage. That is saying something, right? I am not a massive Gilmore fan because I don't really like Floyd, um, but I love him as a guitarist and he's a very, very talented musician. And what he can do without the music is amazing. The stuff he plays, he doesn't, the stuff he isn't playing is the stuff that's the best bit. The music he doesn't play, the notes he misses, the notes, the spaces between the notes. I've done an episode about that. Please go back and listen to it. Um, anyway, I'm getting sidetracked. That guitar had been played by Hendrix, Jeff Beck, Rory Gallagher, to name just a few. Pardon me. That's why his sound is his sound. Okay. And of course, you know, he was a, a Gibson, uh, sorry, a, um, a, a Marshall addict. I mean, I think everything went through a JCM 100, I think. I think that's that we did. And I think, if I remember rightly, watching a, a documentary on his tech setup, he liked uh, Greenback speakers because um, Marshall have different colored back speakers, greens and blacks, and so on. They have different sounds in their cabinets. I think he had Greenbacks, I think. I'll have to go back and rewatch that again. Um, I didn't make a note of it because it wasn't going to be something that was, I thought would be interesting to you. It's interesting to me. Um, maybe I should have done. Anyway, let's now move on to um, his his bands. Okay, uh, he started out, I said, with um, the Skid Row. Uh, after moving to Dublin, as we talked about before, he met he met there in that band Phil Linnett. The Phil Linnett of Liz, Thin Lizzy, the another one of my very big heroes. Um, and Linnett was uh, was sacked after a little while because of uh, he got sick um, and didn't come to rehearsals or some shows, and so they decided to sack him. And the lead singer, the guitarist, then um, took over. They released a couple of albums, um, 34 Hours, they released in 1971, they released, um, uh, where was it? Uh, yeah, Skid, uh, Skid's, re a num which reached number 30 in the UK album chart, which is amazing really, isn't it, if you think about it. They were signed to CBS, this small little band. Um, I actually don't have those albums in my collection. I've got a vast um, Gary Moore collection, well I think it's pretty vast anyway. Says the Vicar to the Nun. Um, it gets smaller in the cold, and my collection gets bigger in the warm. You know. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> I've got Gary Moore's twelve-inch. No, shh, stop it. Um, the uh, I don't have those. Uh, not on vinyl, anyway. I've, I've got them on a you know CD. It's not quite the same. I'd like to get them on vinyl. If anyone of those knows out there has got a copy and wants to donate it to me private message me I won't say no they basically supported the Allman Brothers and Mountain I love Mountain Mountain's a brilliant blues band from the US again YouTube Mountain you'll get a, you will be amazed at this guy's technique and just looking at him he's got hardly any teeth he looks like a real redneck but fuck he can play like that guitar unbelievable um now Sebastian Bach as I mentioned earlier of Skid Row once claimed that Gary sold him the rights to the um, no sorry Gary once claimed that oh my God, Sebastian Bach bought the rights off him for the band Skid Row's name for $35,000 um, this is completely denied by both Sebastian um, and two members of the band a little bit of fancifulness I think on Gary's part uh, and maybe just a little bit of legend building they've all done it and they all do it don't they and after moving on from Skid Row, he joined Thin Lizzy with Phil Linnett, who had formed Lizzy the, that, that same year with Eric, when Eric Bell had moved on. Um, and so they needed someone to tour with them. Uh, now, he toured with them uh, in early 74 and also helped to finish the tour, but he didn't stay with them. He recorded one track, which is Still In Love With You, which I one of my favorites. And appeared on Nightlife after leaving the band in 1974. He left because 
Um, he said that he couldn't keep up and didn't keep up with the drugs and the alcohol. It was ruining his playing. Uh, that was what he said. But he rejoined again in 77 to tour the US after Brian Robertson uh, injured his hand in a bar fight. Um, and then eventually was asked to stay permanently. But again, he declined because of the amount of drinking and alcohol and drugs that he could eat on tour. He just couldn't, it, it was affecting him quite, um, quite badly. But then he came back in 78 uh, when Brian left permanently and, and recorded um, Black Rose, A Legend, which is actually my favorite um, Thin Lizzy album by a long way. Uh, and he toured US and the world with the band. But again, the alcohol was affecting him and he left halfway through the tour. He always felt very guilty about that. Um, but it is, you know, it is what it is, right? And I, thinking back, thought that he'd done a lot more with Lizzie. I, I you know, I swear to you, in my, you know, this sort of um, false memories, I, I thought he'd spent years with, I mean, he had spent years with the band. I mean, Phil was a good friend of his and worked solo, was, you know, worked on Parisian Walkways, the big single of his and all that sort of stuff. And they sort of collaborated for many years on and off. But I just first thought reason he was in, in, in Lizzie Moore. One album, it doesn't, you know, one album, a couple of songs. Anyway, and a couple of tours. There you go. Um, he also, um, when when Phil Lynott died uh, in 1986, um, he performed uh, at the unveiling ceremony of uh, the statue in Dublin, the bronze statue to Phil. Um and and at a fest at a festival to promote you know um, a help aid uh, not promote aid to promote the help with drug abuse. All right. So that's and then and then he sort of jumped and then he went and did a lot of solo stuff. Right, a lot of solo stuff. Okay, I'm I'm going to name the solo albums for you. I'm I'm not going to go through them because this is for the second the second album all right the second part of the show but we've got grinding uh grinding stone back on the streets g-force dirty fingers corridors of power victims of the future run for the corner run for cover sorry um and so on and there's a lot more than that but interestingly he was asked to play with ozzy's band um, and Ozzy, and he turned them down, but he did, then that will be again for the next episode, but he did, a little, little side note, he did help Ozzy uh, audition members of, uh, uh, to, to fill his so first solo band, which I think is, I didn't know that until recently, and that really, um, that really was sort of, it made me feel a bit um, emotional, because I thought, imagine him if he'd, if he'd, um, if he joined Ozzy. Anyway, Wild Frontier, um, After the War, Still, um, still got the blues, and then after hours, uh, and then he did blues for Greeny, and that was one of his last albums. Um, sadly enough, um, oh no, he wasn't. So I turned the page over. Tony, do we turn the page over? Um, he, uh, he got into a bit of electric music. We won't go into that. That's another. That's again for this episode. But different beat. Return to the blues. Back to the Blues, Power of the Blues, Old New b b Ballad Blues, Close As You Get, Bad For You Baby, and then his very last recording was a live recording at Montreux where he actually uh, debuted some of his Celtic rock music he was going to put on his last album, but unfortunately he passed away. Um, he obviously did play with Coliseum, as I mentioned before. It was Coliseum 2, because the first band that had disbanded. It's a jazz fusion kind of band I'm I sit pardon me I sit them in the same on the same shelf as Hawkwind that doesn't do it for me but it's there right I'm sure that someone will say no Tony it's amazing please listen again and I do have his work with Polyseum too and I probably should dig it out and have another listen um, and of course, then he had G-Force, which I mentioned before, but that was his band. That's the time when Ozzy was asking him to, to help out. Um, but then he did two albums with Greg Lake, the amazing Greg Lake of Emerson, Lake and Palmer. Um, Greg Lake, the 
self-titled album and maneuvers i don't have maneuvers and i went through my collection thinking oh, i'll play that i want to i don't remember that one that well i've got greg lake it's absolutely a brilliant brilliant album it's so unlakey it's very rocky um and then you know um he did a live album with greg lake which is a, with a brilliant name a uh, king biscuit flower at the king biscuit flower hour flower spelled f o f o o u r flower hour greg lake live in 1995 and I, another one i don't have i don't think i wouldn't mind doing that um and then he worked with bbm uh, in 1994 that's the bruce um that's the um ginger baker gary moore and um jack bruce two members of cream what a band that could have been oh I, they all hated it ginger baker absolutely loathed gary he even said in an interview that he thought gary was the most uh, egotistical man he ever met which is interesting because ginger ginger uh, ever watched the movie the documentary called ginger about ginger baker there are things in there that will, i mean wonderful drama i mean cream i've said it before and i'll say it again disraeli gears is the greatest psychedelic album ever made i'm sorry don't even put sergeant pepper in the same it's not even the same light um for me personally but yes what a shame it only lasted one album one tour oh wow wow i would have given something to see gary moore ginger baker and jack bruce you know one of my bass playing heroes jack bruce and oh god unbelievable anyway he also then collaborated with uh, skunk and nancy bass player cast lewis and primal scream drummer um darren mooney to form scars and they made one album again i have never heard that album um it's something that's missing from my collection I'm sure it's out there and quite easy to get on CD because it was sort of mid late 90s, so it couldn't have been too hard to find. I'm sure it's there. Um, and I one day might try and hunt it down, but that sounds a pretty interesting. Uh... Oh, I like Skunk and I like Skunk and Nancy. Um, I tell you the truth, I'm not a. Um... I'm not a Primal Scream fan, but I certainly do like Skunk and Nancy because it was punky. It was that mid '90s was when punk was getting found again, and it was all. And she was a powerful, um, you know, dark-skinned singer with an apps, you know, with amazing face paint and just really just in your face, and I loved it. So, as I've, I've scooted quickly over his albums because I'm going to talk about that more next week. So if I do it now, it won't be as much fun to look forward to right but that's gary moore in a quick nutshell okay um i'm sure that the, if you want to read more there are lots of lots of resources out there i have yet to find a, 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 bi a biography of his i'm sure there is one um i've not got one if anyone's got one that could recommend i would absolutely love it uh, a lot of my stuff came from liner notes on records and um and of course the internet the wonderful interwebs what guitarist uh, for you um, touched you in the same way as Gary touched me? Uh, I don't know. I'd love to know. And why, you know? Um, what I loved about Gary as well is that he's known forever for being a blues man because that's what his end of his career, latter part of his career, his most successful part of his career was. But he was also such a chameleon. Many people said that he would follow trends and he hated that. And I don't think that's the case. No, 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 I don't think it's the case. I think, like he said, he played music that made it, that he liked listening to at the time. Nothing wrong with that. I'd rather a musician that does that than just goes, right, all I'm doing is this right through to the end and I don't do anything else. I don't, I don't. Um, where, where, is the, where is the emotional and um, uh, spiritual creativity in that respect? It's not gonna be there, is it? It's gonna, you're just gonna become really bored of what you do. You're just going to be the, you're just going to be the Rolling Stones. Uh, you know, I'd like some of their money and their fame, possibly, but um, of course, wouldn't we all? But you know what I mean. It's just going to be one-dimensional. You're just going to be ACDC again. And I know, don't shout and throw things at me. 
I find ACDC one dimensional. I do. I really, really do. Um, you know, that's a difference between like bands like Black Sabbath. You know, they they tried to change their sound. They've varied their sound. Def Leppard, exactly the same thing. I'm not a huge, wonderful fan of latter Def Leppard albums, but they did the same thing. They moved on. They knew what they were looking for. They got in the right direction. Maiden is exactly the same. Um, the Who, classic The Who, were another big, another big one of those things. So, anyway, I sidetracked again. Please do come to my Facebook page and private message me or leave notes on the show notes. Like go onto Spotify and and you can leave notes there. Not rude ones though, please. Or you or YouTube or um, iTunes or wherever you get your you get you're listening to me, and let me know who was the guitarist. It, it doesn't matter who it is. Um, you know, I mean, I got a friend of mine, and I'm and I'm also very I you know a guitar. You know, I don't know if you know or you've heard of Joe Nama Trading. Wonderful, wonderful guitarist from the seventies and eighties. She was an amazing guitarist. She's not one of those ones that when I heard as a kid sort of blew my mind I didn't realize how good someone could be with a guitar and she's one of those see so there's lots of them um if there is one out there let me know you let me know what you what you what you I'd like to just and I'm not just know who but a little bit of why if you can be creative in some writing otherwise just let me know who um that's enough for this week I've um I, I, quite a slightly shorter one by about four, five or six minutes this week because I just wanted to give a quick brief rundown of Gary, his life, what he means to me. Um, and then next week will be a slightly longer episode because um, I'm going to have to spend, I've already spent the last four days um, through running through my collection. I've already knew in my head, I'm pretty good like that. I know where, what's my favorite albums, I know what my favorite tracks are. But sometimes you have to delve in to see if there's a, at that particular moment what changes because it could change tomorrow. It could change as soon as I put this, turn the mic off. You just never know, right? Anyway, keep safe, guys. Chat to you next week. Please go and listen to Gary. Have a good listen to whatever you can get. All his, most of his stuff is on Spotify and iTunes and whatever platform you choose. There are other platforms out there. Um, his physical media is up. easy to buy if you want to buy a CD. You can get them really cheaply now. Uh, there's some beautiful things on vinyl. Like you, could, They've just re-released... Um, Still got the blues on blue vinyl, I think it was. Uh, lovely pressing, 180 gram pressing, much better than my original pressing. So I've got both, and why wouldn't you? Um, anyway, me wobb- wobb- waffling on again. Time to go. Keep safe, look after yourselves, and keep loving the blues, all right? <laughs> if you do. Anyway, bye for now. Miracles do happen. A gorgeously imaginative new musical is now on Broadway. Water for Elephants is a New York Times critic's pick. It's stunning, emotional, spellbinding entertainment. A dazzling love story, propulsive with passion. Don't miss the best new musical on Broadway. Water for Elephants. Get tickets now at telecharge.com and choose the ride. Even when we're on a budget, we still deserve nice things. Quince is a place to scoop up stunning high-end goods for 50 to 80% less than similar brands. They have buttery soft cashmere sweater starting at $50, luxurious Italian leather bags, and so much more. Plus, Quince only works with factories that use safe, ethical, and responsible manufacturing. Get the high-end goods you'll love without the high price tag with Quince. Go to quince.com style for free shipping and 365-day returns.